Hi everyone, this is Miss Pleasure on the Floyd County campus and I'm going to lecture today on chapter 13 in your Safe Maternity and Pediatric Nursing Care book. So we're going to begin on page 190 and the chapter is the physio Physiological and Behavior Adaptations During the Postpartum Period. Okay. So one of the first things before we even get started with the lecture is everyone really needs to be familiar with key terms. So when you're studying this chapter, it's a very short chapter. There's no reason not to read the entire chapter, uh, not just rely on the study guide that I'm planning on giving you guys at the end of the week because that doesn't really always cover everything as you should know by now. Um, so go over your key terms that are on page 190. You need to be familiar with all of those. Um, you also really need to pay attention anything you're studying in your nursing book, any tables, any illustrations, any um, like real world case studies, anything that's bulleted is usually a really important point that you really need to understand and is probably going to come back to you at some point either on um, a chapter test, the exam, or even your HESI at some point in the NCLEX. So just know that those are highlighted, they're bulleted for a reason, they're really important. So those are things that you really need to pay especially close attention to. Okay, so we're going to get started. So now we're going to discuss the postpartum physical adaptations that the mother undergoes after delivery of the placenta. So the postpartum period is also known as the Pure period is the six week period following the delivery of the placenta and lasts until the reproductive organs return to a non pregnant state. So, one of the changes that happens immediately after delivery is postpartum shivering. Um, the exact causes are not known. You can provide a warm blanket to the mother and reassure her that the shivering will pass. It occurs in about 25 to 50 percent of women. The shivering is noticeable and may frighten the woman. It may occur any time from 1 to 30 minutes after delivery and last for 2 to 60 minutes. The exact cause of the shivering is not known, but it is thought to be related to the fetal maternal transfusion that occurs when the placenta was delivered and maternal and fetal blood have the opportunity to mix. And then if you look down, there is actually a link to a video that shows what it looks like on YouTube. Um, so if you guys want to check that out, that might help kind of give you an idea of how it looks. If you've ever had a baby or been in a room at delivery, you may have seen this. It's really kind of scary. And sometimes the mother will be very nervous about it and have a lot of questions, but just reassure her that that's just normal. That is a normal physical change of her body after delivery. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to discuss is some of the reproductive system changes that occur after delivery. And so we're going to talk first about involution, which refers to the change that the reproductive organs, particularly the uterus, undergo after birth of the newborn to return to the pre-pregnant size and condition. So immediately after the placenta is delivered, estrogen and progesterone levels drop quickly and oxytocin continues to be released. So remember, oxytocin is the feel-good hormone that's usually released and stimulated also by breastfeeding, which we'll get into that a little bit later on. And so it continues to be released, which causes the uterus to contract and to begin the process of shrinking down to a non-pregnant size. The process is called involution, and involution is an important term you guys all need to be familiar with. So it's talking about the size and weight decreases of the uterus, the fundal decrease, after pains can occur. That's from the shrinking, from the muscle shrinking, and exfoliation of the uterus at the placental site. After delivery, the uterus is the size of a grapefruit. The top portion, known as the fundus, is located midline and halfway between the umbilicus and the symphys pubis. Within approximately one hour, the fundus is firm and even with the umbilicus. So our hour after birth, that uterus is, when you palpate, you should be able to feel it right around the belly button or the umbilicus of the, of the mother. But the uterus will continue to decrease approximately one centimeter. And as also, you may see that one centimeter referred to as a finger's breadth, which is the 
the end of your finger, the tip of your finger, that's a finger's breadth, that's about one centimeter per day. So the uterus continues to descend approximately one centimeter per day or one finger breadth per day. And usually by day 10, the uterus is not palpable above the symphys pubis. So the fundus should be midline. A uterus that is deviated from the midline usually requires emptying of the bladder in order for involution to continue. A full or distended bladder can push the uterus up and cause it to deviate to one side or the other, and it's generally on the right side, and interfere with involution. So what that's going to do, if the bladder is full, then that can help, that will cause the uterus to not contract like it should, so it may be boggy feeling, and you're going to notice that the patient's going to have more bleeding or more locule discharge. If blood clots collect within the uterus, contractions can stop and the fundus of the uterus will rise and feel boggy. This results in increased bleeding. So make sure that the mother is emptying her bladder frequently to help with this involution. Okay, the intermittent contractions that some women describe as cramping are called afterpains. These can occur for the first two to three days postpartum and are a normal process to prevent bleeding. After pains are caused by the re release of oxytocin. After pains are more noticeable for multiparous women, so women who have had more children, because the uterus has been stretched before and must work harder to regain tone and return to the non-pregnant size. Okay, so if you guys will look in your books at page 191, there's actually a diagram that shows you where you should be feeling the fundus at different um, different increments, like six to 12 hours after birth or post delivery of the placental. So post delivery of the placenta, it should be at um, the umbilicus. So that would be about 12 hours post delivery. It would be at the umbilicus at two days, it's gonna be below, but you can refer to um, the diagram on 191 to see exactly where that's going to be. Some other things that you guys need to consider with involution is some patient teaching, which your guidelines are on the box on page 192, which is important to look at as well. After pains can be quite intense and painful for women who have given birth previously because of a decrease in uterine muscle tone. After pains can also be noticed while breastfeeding as a result of nipple stimulation, which causes the release of oxytocin. The after pains usually last for a few days and can be alleviated with ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Immediately after the delivery of the placenta, the interlacing uterine muscles contract the blood vessels that were attached to the placenta to prevent hemorrhaging. In addition, the large blood vessels at the site where the placenta was attached thrombose, which means that the blood clots caused the vessels, pre that blood clots closed the vessels, preventing hemorrhage from the placental attachment site. At the placental site, the process of exfoliation begins. Exfoliation is the sloughing of dead tissue at the placental site, leaving the site smooth and without scar tissue. This allows successful implantation of a fertilized ovum in subsequent pregnancies. The inner lining, which is the endometrial surface of the uterus, begins to slough off, resulting in a vas vaginal discharge made up of blood and necrotic decidua. The discharge is known as lochia. And so we're going to talk some more about lochia, but lochia, there's three different stages of lochia that you're going to notice postpartum. And if you're assessing your patient at the hospital, you're probably only going to see this first stage, which is lochia ruby, rubra. So lochia rubra is the bright red lochia discharge that lasts from one to three days. And it can have some small clots, that's, that's pretty normal. Lochia serosa is pink or brown and lasts four to nine days. Lochia alba is yellow white and lasts up to six weeks. Okay. All right, so next we're going to go into a little more detail about lochia and how to estimate the lochial flow of your patient. 
So estimating the amount of lochial flow is difficult, but estimating excessive lochia is important. And it's important because that's an early indication of some issues, especially with postpartum hemorrhage. And we'll talk more about that in chapter 14. So we're not going to really get all into that during this chapter or this lecture, just because this is just an overview of all the things we need to assess in the changes. So, um, you are going to estimate lochia flow by using the method of just looking at the pads. You can weigh the pads, but you're also going to kind of have to teach the mother or your patient how to estimate how much blood loss it is by looking at her pads because she's probably not going to have a way of, me of measuring weight when she goes home. So what you need to do is count the number of pads being change per hour. Pads can be weighed at the hospital. Like I said, but the mother's probably not going to have a way of doing that or want to do that at home. One gram equals one milliliter of blood. Check fundal firmness and document per facility protocol. So if you're going to say that she has scant local discharge, then that would be a two inch stain or 10 milliliters. Small would be a four inch stain or an estimated 10 to 25 milliliters of blood. Moderate is a 6 inch stain and is 25 to 50 milliliters and large is greater than 6 inch stain which would equal 50 to 80 milliliters. Okay, so we're going to go back to the assessment of the bundle firmness. When you are assessed in bundle firmness, you need to note the firmness, the location, position to the midline and it should be performed at routine intervals. And a clean pad should be applied and checked for local volume. Okay, so remember with that, if you palpate and it's boggy or deviated, the uterus is boggy or deviated, then more than likely your patient needs to go void because probably the bladder being full is causing the shift and causing the uterus not to contract like it normally should, and that can cause increased local flow. So your initial lochia is bright red and is commonly called lochia rubra. That usually lasts from one to three days and may contain small clots and that is very normal to have small clots. By the fourth day, the lochia should become lighter in color. Lochia serosa is pale and becomes pink to brown and may last up to 27 days and it should contain no clots. Typically by day 10 postpartum, the vaginal discharge becomes yellow to white and is called lochia alba. One thing that you really need to also know when you are assessing your patient postpartum is that the amount of lochia is less after a cesarean birth. Women who have had cesarean births tend to have less blood flow or less lochial flow because the uterine debris is removed manually along with the delivery of the placenta. So just know, you know, if you have a lady who's had a C-section that you're going to have less lochia discharge on her pads or just discharge in general due to having the section. So if you notice that it was, um, you know, a lot more than that's definitely something to be concerned about. And like I said, we're not really going to go into that now because we have a whole lot to talk about that in chapter 14. But just know that it will be less on a cesarean delivery than on a vaginal delivery. Okay, so the next changes that we're going to talk about are with the cervix, the vagina, and the perineum. And this is um, postpartum changes of the cervix. The Oz closes slowly and by day 14 is barely dilated. Okay, after birth, the cervix is soft. By 18 hours postpartum, it has regained its usual form. It gradually closes around two weeks postpartum, but never regains its original appearance. At the six week checkup, the cervical Oz should look like a slit. Okay, so after pregnancy, the Oz, and the Oz is the opening of the cervix, which was, remember, during delivery, last stages of delivery, it's dilated to 10. So it closes slowly, and by day 14, it's barely dilated. And then at the lady's six week postpartum checkup, um, the cervix should appear to look like a slit. So after pregnancy, it's changed forever. The Oz looks like a slit instead of a circle or a dot. 
and it's often described as a fish mouth. Okay, so that's just a little way to help you remember that the cervix definitely changes forever after delivery. All right, so next we're going to talk about the vagina, which is after delivery lacks muscle tone. Over the four weeks, edema decreases and rugae appear, and it will never return to its pre-pregnant size. By the fourth postpartum week, the vagina resents resumes the appearance of the pre-pregnant state, so that just means that the tissue is back to normal, with some relaxation of the tissue. Kegel exercises can promote the return of tone to perineal and vaginal areas, so it's really important to do teaching on Kegel exercises. There is, on page 192 in your book, there is a uh, box that has like all about Kegels and how to do the Kegel exercise, and that's something that you would definitely teach your new mother. So then we're going to go on to the um, perineum, which can be bruised and edematous after delivery. Of course, if you had a cesarean, you're not going to have any of this. This is just a vaginal delivery. So after a vaginal delivery, the perineum will be bruised and edematous. The tone is restored over four to six weeks, and then the Kegel exercises help to promote the return of tone. So Kegel will help promote the return of tone to your pelvic floor muscles. So that's what it does. It helps to return the, pel the pelvic floor muscle tone. Ovaries and ovulation. So the resumption of normal function of the ovaries is variable and influenced by breastfeeding. Menstruation is usually delayed and may not resume for weeks or months for breastfeeding women. And that depends on how much and how often the infant is breastfed. The delay is caused by the suppression of ovulation by the hormone prolactin. Before milk production begins, the breast secrete colostrum, a thin yellow fluid that provides nutrition and antibodies to the breastfeeding infant. The, nip the nipple stimulation provided by the infant causes a release of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. The hormone prolactin initiates milk production, and between the second and fourth day, the breasts become engorged with milk. The breasts may feel warm and tender. The mother refers to this as having their milk come in. Women who choose not to breastfeed will also experience the milk coming in. Health promotion for a woman who is not breastfeeding would be to avoid nipple stimulation, wearing a tight-fitting bra that provides compression to the breast, using ice packs on the breast to promote comfort, avoid applying heat to the breast, such as warm or hot showers, not expressing milk from the breast. Expressing milk triggers the body to produce more milk. And you can see every bit of this on page 193. There's um, halfway down the page, there's just a box that has all of these listed for you. If you like to just highlight and start writing all this down. Um, one thing to note about ovaries and ovulation, even if you're breastfeeding, you can still ovulate as early as 27 days after delivery. That's important to know to teach your mother because she can still get pregnant even if she's breastfeeding. I actually had a friend who um, went back to her six week checkup and was pregnant. So that does happen. So that's something just to kind of consider too. So next we're going to talk about the changes to the integumentary system and the gastrointestinal system postpartum. So starting with integumentary system, the abdominal skin will resume its pre-pregnancy state with the exception of abdominal striae or stretch marks, which may take weeks to fade to a silvery color. The lina nigra down the middle of the abdomen will fade but may never completely go away. The effects of the melanocyte stimulating hormones, which cause skin hyperpigmentation called melasma on the face, will fade away over a period of days and weeks. If there's any hair loss, hair loss after the postpartum period is also common, but usually resolves without medical intervention. Okay, so after delivery with the gastrointestinal system, most women are hungry and thirsty because of the amount of energy exerted during the birthing process. 
Food and fluids may have been restricted during labor, and that is very common as well. Most women are only given ice chips during labor, so that's why they're so thirsty and hungry afterwards. Um, and also, if they're breastfeeding, that uses a lot of fluid as well, so they, that can also increase the thirst. They may have sluggish intestinal peristalsis and constipation. The combination of these restricted intake about elevated progesterone levels during pregnancy and anesthesia can lead to sluggish intestinal peristalsis and constipation and can also cause hemorrhoids which can cause pain with defecation. So a lot of times they'll go ahead and put them on a, the doctor will go ahead and order a stool softener to help with that. So you may see that given as an order as well in the postpartum area. Now we're going to go on to the cardiovascular system in the postpartum patient. 60 to 80 percent increase in cardio, cardiac output occurs immediately after delivery. It will return, the cardiovascular output can return to nearly normal levels by one hour post delivery. And a loss of plasma volume causes temporary rise in hemoglobin and hematocrit. Fibrinogen levels increase and remain increased for several days after delivery. And that also can cause increased risk of blood clot development. So we're just going to go from the beginning and start talking about why this all happens. So during the postpartum adaptation, dramatic and immediate changes take place in the circulating blood volume that prevent hypovolemia from normal blood loss during delivery. So all these changes are nature's way of taking care of the mother during the postpartum recovery stage. Elimination of placenta diverts 500 to 750 milliliters of blood flow into the maternal systemic circulation and reduction of size of the uterus puts more blood system circulating. Blood flow to the vena cava is increased due to the elimination of the gravid uterus compressing against it. So once the baby is born, the uterus is no longer pushing against the vena cava. That also helps to increase the cardiac output in the mother. Excessive blood volume, which is necessary during pregnancy, is removed to help the woman's body return to the pre-pregnant state. And it's done in two different ways, which one way is diuresis, which that is just through urination, through eliminating fluids through urination, and the other one is diaphoresis or sweating. Elimination of excess fluid through the skin, which is sweating. Profuse diaphoresis occurs most often at night, so that's something that sometimes concerns the mother. They may be very sweaty, um, sweat more than usual, so you may get that question, and that's just the body's way of trying to return to its previous cardiac output, so by getting rid of the extra fluids through sweat. During this phase, tachycardia is something that you should not really see in your patient. The pulse rate should return to normal range, which is 60 to 80 beats per minute. So if you have tachycardia in postpartum women, it warrants further investigation. It can be indicative of hypovolemia, dehydration, or hemorrhage. Despite a decrease in blood volume after birth, the hematocrit levels can remain relatively stable and may even increase. An acute decrease is not an expected finding. So if you have a patient who has a decrease in hematocrit levels, then you really need to investigate that um, because that could be an early sign of postpartum hemorrhaging. So we'll talk more about that once again in chapter 14. An acute decrease is not an expected finding. The white blood cell count remains elevated for the next four to six days and clotting factors remain elevated for two to three weeks. And that is the um, fibrid, fibrogen, I can't even say this word, fibrinogen level, fibrinogen level. I have to say it slowly. So um, there's also a temporary rise in H and H due to the increase in the number of red blood cells, which is the loss of plasma is greater versus the red blood cells. So that basically means that the plasma loss is 
kind of like with a patient with congestive heart failure. When you lose the fluids on your lab work, it looks like the RBCs are elevated because it's, it's more concentrated. If you will look on page 193 at safety stat, there's some information within here that you really, really, really need to pay attention to. Um, because of increased levels of fibrinogen, the postpartum patient is more susceptible to blood clots, and that's very important to remember. Therefore, ambulation is important for the patient to prevent venous stasis in the legs. So one of the first things you're going to do with your patient is ambulation. You want to get them ambulated so that they have a decreased risk for developing a blood clot. The postpartum patient's body begins to remove excess fluids stored during pregnancy by the process of di diuresis, which is the secretion and passage of large amounts of urine. So we already kind of went over that a little bit. And diaphoresis, which is normal after delivery, and diaphoresis is once again just sweating. The woman may excrete up to 3,000 milliliters of fluid per day for the first few days. With your lab, you may see an increase in neutrophils, which are the white blood cells that fight infection. It's normal in the postpartum period, like we've already discussed. Um, this is because of inflammation, pain, and stress of birth. White blood cell count may increase to levels as high as 3,000 cells per millimeters. So that's, that's a very common finding. It does not mean that she has an infection. That is just the body's way of responding. A lot of times um, in your post pardon patients and post-surgical patients your body goes in through an inflammation process and that is why you see high wet, white blood cell counts in these patients because of the stress and that is a normal body response so just remember that's normal so next we're going to talk about the respiratory system and the urinary system in postpartum patients the elevated diaphragm in late pregnancy will return to its normal position and this will cause a reduction in shortness of breath and it makes breathing easier. The postpartum patient's respiratory rate will return to the pre-pregnancy level. Pregnancy nasal congestion will also disappear quickly. Your patient may also experience relief of rib aching as the elevated diaphragm returns to the normal position. And with the urinary system, the urinary bladder and urethra are edematous after delivery because of the effects of the fetus passing through the birth canal. The bladder tone decreases and a woman may not feel the urge to urinate. Therefore, the bladder can become distended and push the uterus upward into the side. And remember, it's usually to the right side, but it can be either. A distended bladder can displace the uterus and interfere with the ability of the uterus to contract and to control bleeding. The nurse must monitor for a distended bladder to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Poor bladder tone and poor emptying of the bladder can also lead to urinary tract infections. So that's something that you really need to watch out for in the postpartum phase. The nurse must monitor the patient for signs of a urinary tract infection, which they include dysuria, which is painful urination, urinary urgency, and, ur and frequency, fever, and tenderness over the cost of vertebral angle. So those are all signs and symptoms that you should be looking for with urinary tract infection. Because remember, you can't really go by the labs. You have to actually assess your patient for these, these possible symptoms. And the best way to prevent it is just to encourage urination. And of course, if, you have, if your patient is unable to urinate, you may have to, to get an order and put a catheter in. And that will just all depend upon your evaluation of your patient. On to the muscular skeletal system. With the delivery of the placenta, the effects of progesterone on the muscle tone is removed. Muscle tone begins to be restored throughout the body. The hormone relaxin, which is responsible for relaxing the pelvis ligaments and joints during pregnancy in anticipation of delivery, begins to subside. The woman may feel hip pain for a few days as the hips recover from overflexion during pushing and as she experiences the effects of tightening of her pelvis to her pre-pregnant state. So that's very common for your patient to complain of having hip pain. Diastasis recti of the abdominal muscles may occur, and this is a separation of abdominal wall muscles. 
It can be corrected with exercises, but you just need to let your, your patient know that generally abdominal exercises cannot begin until four weeks postpartum for a vaginal delivery and six weeks postpartum for a cesarean delivery. If uh, over time the exercises don't help, eventually she may end up having to have surgery to correct this, but that would be something later on down the line that the doctor would have to discuss with her. Postpartum psychological adaptations. Maternal role attainment is the process by which the woman learns mothering behaviors and becomes comfortable with her identity as a mother. It occurs in four stages, the anticipatory stage, the formal stage, the informal stage, and the personal stage. In the anticipatory stage, this occurs during pregnancy. It's when she looks to role models on how to be a mother. Formal stage begins with the newborn when it's born and mom is still being influenced by the guidance of others. Informal is when the mother starts to make her own choices about mothering and finds her own style. Personal stage is when mom does what she is comfortable with and role in the role of mother and this occurs three to 10 months after delivery. Today's new mothers tend to be less dependent and are better able to assume the self-care responsibilities. Alternately, parents who are ill-prepared for the changes in relationships, lifestyle, and roles associated with the integration of the newborn into the family unit have more difficulty making necessary transitions. So there are three phases of postpartum adjustment. And the first phase is known as the taking in phase. In the taking in phase, the mother is centered on her own needs, such as rest, pain relief, sleeping, and eating. She feels dependent at this time and needs mothering herself. Um, she may also assume a passive role in the care of the newborn, and that's very normal during this phase. The mother may often want to review her labor and delivery experience this review helps her to integrate it with the reality of her baby being born and the reality of motherhood. She may not initiate interaction with the newborn, but when handed the newborn to hold, she will stroke the baby with her fingertips and may position the baby facing her so that she can explore the baby's face. This is known as the on-face position. Fingertip touching and the on-face position are signs of positive bonding behaviors. The taking in of information allows her to identify her infant and begin the bonding process. Bonding is the start of a lifelong relationship with the newborn. The mother begins to feel a closeness and a love for her baby. Bonding may occur instantaneous for some women, but for others it is a slower process that grows over a few days or weeks. The taking in process may last a day or two. So if you have a new mother who is touching the baby and has the baby in an on-face position, those are all signs of a positive bonding experience. So the next phase is the taking hold phase. And in this stage, the mother is preoccupied with the present and with care for herself and the newborn. So during the taking hold phase, the mother initiates care of the baby. She wants to be more independent, is concerned and anxious about her own physical care, breastfeeding and baby care, requires praise and positive reinforcement and is open to learning. So this is a good time to start your teaching. May last up to 10 or more days. And one of the things is during this phase, she may experience postpartum blues. So with postpartum blues, a woman may feel sad, irritable, or spontaneously erupt into tears for reasons she cannot explain. Usually this sadness passes after a good cry or in a day or two. And to, so what you need to think about doing is uh, providing support for the patient and also do your teaching with the patient about what to expect with postpartum blues. And this is something that is normal. It's a normal um, phase that postpartum women go through and that is self-limiting and you also want to include her caregiver in on the teaching so that they know what's going on if she's crying or or having the blues there is a difference between postpartum blues and postpartum depression and we're going to talk more about postpartum depression in chapter 14. okay so the third phase is the letting go phase 
And in the letting go phase, the mother reestablishes relationships with others and has increased confidence in care of herself and her newborn. In this phase, she's letting go of being childless and she's more independent. Attachment with the newborn occurs. She learns to understand her infant's cries and body language, receives positive feedback from the infant when needs are met, and learns to trust herself and her instincts as a mother. Okay, so next we're going to talk about development of family attachment. So family attachment may take more time. Fathers begin bonding by attending health care appointments, ultrasound appointments, and childbirth classes. You should also encourage the father to room in and stay as much as possible with the mother and the newborn at the hospital. And on page 195 in your book, there's um, under the health promotion box, you can see ways of promoting bonding. And these are nursing interventions that you can use to promote bonding with the newborn, um, such as promote skin to skin contact between the parents and the newborn, encourage breastfeeding, encourage eye contact, and allowing the baby to stay with the parents as much as possible and avoiding unnecessary trips to the nursery. So those are all interventions that you as a nurse can use to encourage bonding. So we're going to talk next about engrossment. Engrossment is characterized by seven behaviors. Visual awareness of the newborn, tactile awareness of the newborn, which tactile is actually touching, perception of the newborn as perfect, strong attraction to the newborn, awareness of distinct fixtures, features of the newborn, an extreme elation, and increased sense of self-esteem. Some positive behaviors that indicate attachment to the newborn include identifying common features, and that would be like saying, oh, he looks like you, or he's got your eyes or your nose, and making direct eye contact with the newborn. And so this is all related to the father. Um, an example of not having in good bonding or maybe having impaired bonding with the newborn would be if the mother is making uh, negative comments about the baby's appearance, then that can sometimes make you wonder if there's some bonding issues. So just kind of be aware of that sort of thing. Um, and if you have a father who identifies a lot of imperfections in the baby, then that might indicate that he has not yet achieved engrossment. So engrossment is where you really want the father to be as far as bonding. That is a positive bonding. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to talk about is sibling bonding and attachment. Sibling bonding and attachment can be promoted by allowing the sibling to visit the hospital. Phone and video technology can allow the child to have easy contact with his or her mother when she is hospitalized, but a visit with her in the hospital will reduce separation anxiety and feelings that the new baby is more important than he or she is. A visit with mom, dad, and the new baby will promote family bonding faster. The parents need to be cautioned that the older child may exhibit signs of jealousy and may regress in his or her behavior. An example of a regression would be if a three-year-old was potty trained and then began wetting his pants. Even if older siblings are prepared for the birth and the new family member, their behavior may be unpredictable. The child may also express uncomplimentary opinions about the new baby, and often the sibling facilitates between protective, loving feelings and dislike for the new family member. So every one of these uh, behaviors is, is normal for a sibling during the bonding phase. Okay, so now we're just gonna review a few questions here so you guys can look into your book or just use the slides to do this. So the first question is, a new mother who is bottle feeding says that she is happy to not have to use birth control for several months after having a baby. What should the nurse say in response? A, that's right. B, you might ovulate within 27 days. C, most people don't need it for three months, or D, you won't need to use it for at least six months. So the correct answer is B. 
because a woman who is not breastfeeding may ovulate as early as 27 days after delivery. If birth control is not used, the woman can become pregnant again. The mother's belief is not correct. Menstruation begins in 6 to 12 weeks for bottle feeding women. However, birth control will be needed before 3 months or 6 months. So, you just need to make sure that she understands that she can get pregnant if she's bottle feeding. So for the next review question, the nurse determines that a new mother is in the taking hold phase of psychological adjustment. What did the nurse observe to make this conclusion? A. Wants help with her own needs. B. Ask questions about the baby's care. C. Holds the baby in the on face position. D. Says the baby's cry means he's hungry. And so the answer is B. And the, the reason the answer is B is because during the taking cold phase, the mother is open to learning about the baby's needs. Wanting help with her own needs and holding the baby in the on face position are all characteristics of the taking in phase. So all three of those, and you can you can rule those three out because of that. Uh, saying that the baby's cry means he's hungry is a characteristic of the letting go phase.